All right, this is Ryan Womack. I'm Data Librarian at Rutgers University. We're back with part six of the Data Visualization in R series. And in this section, we are going to look at what I would call a miscellany of visualizations. This starts on slide 45. And we're going to look at many different techniques that you can use to see how your data is spread out. Uh, one little thing that I want to show you before we get into that is in section 4.1 and this is the method for exporting images. So if you're in our studio you have one method that's already available to you which is you can click on the export button up at the top and you can save an image or save it as a PDF and when you click save you can adjust the size of the image that you're saving, the format, etc. So that's pretty convenient. But sometimes we want to do that within an R script itself and we can do that in code in section 4.1. So we run a command PDF to redirect all of our output from the screen to a PDF file. And then we can run actually multiple uh, graphics commands and um, we can then turn the device off with this dev off command. And once we do that we get a little cryptic confirmation uh, and then we can find that our output file which we've named output PDF is going to be inside our default R directory and let's just take a look at that here we go um, here's one output PDF and um, you know I didn't adjust this in any way to make it perhaps less busy. It looks like our axes are a bit crowded, but we do have uh, a PDF version of that document. If we wanted to run it as a JPEG, we can just use JPEG and specify some options about the image size. Also supports PNG files, um, TIFF files, several other formats are supported. So it's pretty easy to do that even within the code and have your code automatically generate a series of images. All right. So let's move to section 4.2 and we're going to look at the Cleveland dot plot. So as we discussed in the earlier section, with Cleveland was William Cleveland was a person who really promoted the use of the dot plot as an alternative to the bar chart. And what is that exactly? So we're going to attach a data set. This data set is called MT cars. It's built into R and it's a very straightforward data set that just has some data about about 30 vehicles, their miles per gallon, their horsepower, the size of the engine, a few things like that. Uh, from Actually, if you look at these model names, you'll realize that these are cars from the 1970s, basically. Uh, so it's an older sample data set. Um, we're going to, just for convenience, pr provide some labels uh, that are more human readable in the next section. And then we get to the command that on my screen is line 259 right now. I think my code has been edited by a couple of lines, so it might not match your screen. But we run dot plot. And this is a version of a dot plot. Uh, we are using the lattice package for this. So we, again, have the same method of using the vertical bar to break it into categories. And here we've, our categories are the number of gears or speeds in the transmission of the car. And there are only three, four, and five here. This is an older data set again. And you can see the data points are there. Uh, and we can actually observe all of the data points and how they're spread out. So there's no summary here. This is the, the visualization of the raw data. And this works pretty well for data sets up to, you know, sort of a, a small to medium size. Now, what we can do with the dot plot beyond this is because we're plotting only the dots, we're not plotting a lot of ink onto the screen, um, we have some other options for display. So, for example, I can sort the data in order by the highest miles per gallon to the lowest, and I can do things like color code the dots and the dots here are coded by the number of cylinders. We can see the eight-cylinder cars have very low gas mileage and the four-cylinder cars have high and there's a little bit of zone in between for the six cylinders. Um, we can 
easily sort of add this extra information to the to the visuals because the visual is not busy already. We have these sort of faded uh, lines that let our lets our eye easily track out to see which point matches which label. Um, but we're also not cluttering the screen with you know heavy bars or something like that. So we can see where the points are pretty clearly, and we can continue to add things because we've got some room to do that. For example, we can plot multiple things on the same axis. So in this example, I've actually reversed the miles per gallon order. It's low to high. The blue dots are the miles per gallon. And I've also plotted on the same horizontal line the size of the engine, uh, compensated for by a factor so that the scales are similar. And we can see this inverse relationship that the big engines have low miles per gallon and vice versa. And you can think about uses for this where you might have uh, multiple observations of one subject that you want to show how they're distributed. Are they grouped close together or spread out? Um, we can do that pretty easily with the dot plot. So it gives us some more possibilities than a bar chart would in, the, in those cases. All right, so that's the Cleveland dot plot. Um, the next on our list is the kernel density plot. So a kernel density plot is a, a way to estimate the underlying distribution of the data. And we can run the command in R, density plot. Again, a lattice command. And so for our car data, uh, this is what the density looks like. Um, it shows us that the probability of the the cars in the in the sample being uh, in this zone, say between 15 and 20 miles per gallon, that's really sort of the, the highest concentration of vehicles, and then it sort of tapers off as you get higher. Uh, the dots along the bottom are the actual data points, so if you don't have that many data points to plot, you can actually see um, how they're spread out. But the density plot gives you this abstract representation. Um, you can adjust the methods that are used to calculate the density by getting in and tweaking the function um, in R. You can do other things with the plot. Uh, because it's a lattice function, you can break it into panels or groups. And let me just, in the next section, I improve the layout a bit by specifying the layout command so that we can see them all stacked up. And now we can easily see the the differences between the eight, six, and four cylinder cars. And we see there is some overlap. If, if I told you that I have a car that gets about 20, 22 miles per gallon, in that zone it could be an eight, six, or four cylinder car. But if it's higher, you know, we have a very, um, it's pretty likely that that's a four cylinder. If it's lower, we're getting into the eight cylinder territory. And that density function, uh, again, can be a useful summary representation of the spread of the data. This method works equally well when you have a lot of data points compared to just a few. Now, we've also looked at the scatter plot matrix um, briefly earlier for the diamonds data, but let's run it again on the cars data. This is a smaller data set, so we have a, an easier time seeing all the points. So what we're doing is plotting each of the numerical variables against each other, skipping some of the category variables. And I can, again, color code the points by the number of cylinders using the groups command. And I can sort of pick out places where there's separation between the cylinder groups. Some variables don't show that separation. They're more sort of mixed up, and others uh, do to a greater extent. So this is a way to kind of explore all of your data at once, the, the way that different variables relate to each other. Uh, once again, scatter plot matrix, and the command is splom. OK, so we have covered slide 45. Now we're turning to slide 46, and we're going to look at a few more ways of looking at the distribution of data. Um, and the first of those is the box and whiskers plot. Now this is a pretty well-known plot um, promoted by Tukey, John Tukey, 
but it's it's widely used so you may have seen this one before in different versions uh, the box and whiskers plot is a way of summarizing the distribution of the data uh, so it again works very well on large data sets too and the idea of the box plot is for each of these boxes let's look at this long box here which are the four-cylinder cars that have four speeds in their transmission so that's a larger group it has a wider range of data the black dot is the median of the data and so that is the point at which 50 percent of the data lies below 50 percent lies above the box represents the middle half or middle 50 percent of the data so the ranging from the 25th percentile up to the 75th percentile so you can think of that as a way of seeing where the center of the data is and then the whiskers represent the uh, full range of the data in this sense it it and actually there is some there's no complete consensus on how far out you plot the whiskers it could be two or three standard deviations away from the the center um, but the idea is that almost all of the data especially if the data is normally distributed lies within that range but and you may see in a larger data set this data set is small so we don't have any examples on the screen you might see a couple of points plotted out even beyond the whiskers and what that means is that those are true outliers they lie several standard deviations away from the mean or median uh, and but we 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 can sometimes sometimes choose to plot them on a box and whiskers plot just to show the presence of those outliers uh, so you may see these horizontal you may see them vertical um, they're they're widely used but it's it's a good compact understandable way once you understand what the box and the whiskers represent uh, you can get a lot of information about how that data is distributed so that's one example of box and whiskers BW plot in lattice uh, another way to visualize the data which is uh, unusual because it's a text method is the stem and leaf plot and we call it a plot even though it prints out in text down here um, if I do a stem plot of the number of cylinders this is what I get I get four and then I get uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven zeros so that means there are eleven cars in the sample that have four cylinders and I read this as 4.0 4.0 4.0 etc there are seven cars with six cylinders and more than 11 uh, cars with eight cylinders uh, so I can see the distribution of the data but what's unusual about it is I can actually read the value of the data off of the plot at the same time so if I do that a better example may be the miles per gallon if I run stem mpg um, I get this graph or this this printout let me call it and it's a little confusing because I don't have I, I jump in increments of two on the left hand side in this case what I'm going to do is use another parameter the scale parameter which is just a little number that you can tweak up and down you can tr experiment with changing that scale number and I just tweaked it until I got to the point that I have the single digit miles per gallon over here so then this in this case I read the data as 10.4 and 10.4 that I have two cars in this in the set with those values I have 13.3 I have one car that's 14.3 one car that's 14.7 miles per gallon and so on and a, and a whole bunch five cars with 15 and some decimal uh, miles per gallon so I can see the distribution if I kind of turn my head to the side and uh, think of those as bars I can see how many are at each point but if I choose to I can read the, the exact numbers off the, the stem and leaf plot so this doesn't work well at all uh, once you get to a large number of data if I try that for the diamonds data you'll see um, well I've got 
um, you actually read this as point two, as it says here. The decimal is one digit to the left. These are the carats of the 50,000 diamonds. So I have point two o, point two o, blah blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, and by the way, I have 13,000 more observations there that I'm not printing on the screen because I don't have room for that. So that is um, kind of defeating the point. Uh, stem and leaf has maybe a limited range where you can you can use it effectively, uh, but still good to know about. All right, so now we are going to look at the violin plot. Um, and as the slide says, this blends some kind of density information with this, the distribution information of a, in a way that you get from a box and whiskers plot. But it's a little bit more artistic. Um, this is one that I, I do like. It somehow is not used widely, but maybe it could be. Um, in this case, I'm going to use the ggplot version. There's a very nice implementation in ggplot where you just use geom violin as your geometry. And so now we're back to the diamonds data. Uh, we're looking at a plot of the cut of the data versus the price of the data. And so we can see for each of those five cut ratings, there's a very different distribution of the way the data is set up. So you, t you again, you can kind of see, visualize this by turning your head on your side and to the side and looking at it as a density plot. So a big bulge means there's a lot of concentration of points, of data points at that level. So for an ideal diamond, um, a lot of those ideal diamonds turn out they're very small, so they have a low price even though they have the best cut rating. And then it tapers off steeply and fairly smoothly up to the, the top level. But for other cuts, there's almost a, a bimodal situation where you get a little second bulge higher up along the way. And for fair, we get this sort of thick bulge. A lot of the fair diamonds are sort of big diamonds. The larger the diamond, obviously, the more likely it is to contain some flaws that you can't get around. So so they're, they're not cut that well, but they're still pretty big. So the bulge comes much more at a, high, at a higher price level than for many of the other diamonds. And we can keep plotting these violins. And actually, you know, even though we had looked at the diamonds data in several different ways, we, we have um, many new views here that are, are quite... Um, they reveal some new information, like this is the clarity, and the clarity has this big bulges for the high clarity levels, but th the distribution for lower clarity levels are quite different, quite spread out. Um, we didn't see that, even though we've been looking at this data for a long time, we didn't really perceive it in any of our other visualiz visualizations. So I think the violin plot has a lot of, um, again, it's a compact way to represent some extra complexity that may be in your data set. Um, so that's the violin plot. Um, I'm going to mention this other dot plot function that's in in ggplot just to sort of let you know about it. This is, although it's called geom dot plot in ggplot, it is not the Cleveland dot plot that we looked at earlier. This is a less uh, well known or less used kind of way of just plotting some distribution of data on the screen and we're, we're just spreading those uh, dots out to indicate how the, the data is distributed by, in this case, by miles per gallon on the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis doesn't have much of a meaning in this graph. That's a also a little bit confusing. Um, it's just used to spread the points out so that we can see how they're uh, distributed. So that one is not... Um, not a big one that I would recommend, uh, but just to let you know that the ggplot dot plot command is a little bit different than what you might expect. You might want to look at the, the lattice dot plot command. And our, our final example here we're going to use is a heat map. Um, I'm just going to use some built-in um, data, and there's a bit of formatting here to kind of clean up the heat map. Heat map takes a, a little bit of setup and I'm not going to go into how to do that so I'm just going to run this example 
and show you a heat map with the default colors uh, for our cars data. And what a heat map lets you do is lets you have um, a quick look at many different variable uh, combinations of variable and observation at once. So here I've got all the cars and I've got actually all the variables in the data set and I read this as the pink is hot and so that those are high values and the blue, the darker the blue, the cooler it is or the lower value that, the, that it takes on. And if you look at the first column of little squares here. That's the miles per gallon. We can see that the high mileage cars are the little engine Corolla Civic and Fiat 128. And then just below that we have some darker blue that are the low mileage cars like the Lincoln Continental and the Cadillac Fleetwood. So that makes sense. Um, we can use this to see where some significant patterns of activity occur. Uh, you'll also see it a lot in biology and genomic mapping looking for activity gene activity. Um, it's a useful technique. Um, I do find it takes a little bit of tweaking to get the command set up uh, right. So it's you have to make sure that you have your matrix set up where it's it's got all numerical type values that it can plot and uh, you have to adjust your options if by default the heat map is going to generate uh, a dendrogram along the side that categorizes the data, but that often doesn't have the meaning that you might associate with it. Uh, and it's only meaningful in certain contexts. So uh, something that takes a little getting used to um, when you when you start working with it. Uh, so the example that I was focusing focusing on is really the last line of code in the heat map section which has no labeling or categorization along the axes. It's just plotting out those combinations. But still, and also I didn't do anything to improve the default. Uh, you can do a lot to, to change the shades that are used to indicate intensity. Um, you may have very different preferences than this pink or blue combination. Um, it's possible to do all that, but that's some extra tweaking. Okay, so that's a heat map, and with that, I'm going to stop talking about the distributions of data. Our next segment is going to talk about categor categorization and classification methods that have some graphical output. So stay tuned for that in part seven, um, and see you back in a bit.